started recording music, uh, the only real options for doing anything in terms of multi-track was multi-track cassette, like these. I think you probably know what cassettes look like. I've got two boxes of them. I've had them knocking around for years. Uh, occasionally I will delve into one or two of them, pick up a couple of samples. But about three years ago, I thought, well, look, I don't really know how long these tapes are going to last. And if I want to actually keep what's on them, I'm going to need to transfer them to digital. So why don't I just get on and do that? Now, in the process of doing that, I was able to reconnect with tracks which I would not listened to for a couple of decades. And I found quite a lot of interesting stuff. Um, not by any means sort of polished in the way that I would try and do a track now, but Maybe I could sort of finish them off or get the most out of them. So I've been working on that project and uh, the first part of that is now complete. And let me just show you that. So here it is. I'll put a link and you can go and check it out for yourself. A lot of the tracks are free to stream um, so you can get an idea. And if you really like it, then you could consider buying one, I guess. Anyway, the, there's two points to this really. First of all, the technical process of transferring the tapes, which you would think would be relatively straightforward. I did when I started and I wasn't quite right about that. And then there's the artistic considerations. What do you do with the material once you've got it? How do you want to treat it? If you're considering doing something similar, you want to rescue your cassettes, this video will hopefully help you at least consider some of the issues that you might be facing. Yeah, so the summer of uh, 1985, I got myself a Casio CZ101 and I then got the Fostex X15 full track um, recorder, which was the cheapest one that was going. Um, CZ101 was the cheapest polysynth that was going, so they were kind of like a, a good combination. Um, I already had a Yamaha CS5, which I'd bought the year before. And then getting into the next year, beginning of 86, I managed to get a Sequential Pro 1 for about, I think it was 40 or 50 pounds. That's amazing when you think about it now. In terms of effects, I didn't have very much. I had um, a, a mono spring reverb, which um, I'd built myself. And I also had a flanger pedal, so you kind of hear that quite a bit in certain places. And that was pretty much it. It was a very basic studio. Now, in terms of the recording, I would record the tracks, assuming that I needed more tracks, because four, let's face it, is not many tracks. I would then bounce the existing four tracks onto another tape, and then I'd get that new tape and then put it back into the four track and then get myself another couple of tracks. When I captured the cassette material, I wanted to do it in the highest quality I could because I thought, well, I don't really want to be coming back and doing this again in another five years. So um, I would recommend probably going for 24-bit um, definitely as a minimum and um, 96 kilohertz. You want to make sure that you capture all the frequencies that are there. Now, Part of the reason for that is it's not because you're actually going to be able to hear them because the cassette is not going to be capturing anything, well, probably much above 16 kilohertz, actually. But on the chance that there is something a bit more there, when you're, when you, if you want to use the material for samples and you want to, particularly if you want to pitch downwards, then all those higher harmonics are going to start becoming audible. But if you haven't captured them, then, well, then you're missing out, really. So I always like to record quite high frequencies in case I want to sample. This is how I made my life more complicated. Um, I don't have that X15 recorder anymore. In fact, I've got a terrible confession to make here. In 2003, I took it to the dump because I didn't realize it had any value and I didn't think I would ever need it. Now the reason for that was the X15 was slightly different from most of the other four track recorders. 
in that it played at standard speed. And some of the better Tascam ones as well played at double speed. So if it played at normal speed, then I could use a standard tape recorder, then play back two tracks into my recording system, turn the tape over, record the other two tracks backwards into the recording system, and then reverse the direction of the recording. So basically just sort of flip it over. Um, then I've got my first four tracks. Obviously I've got to align them, I've got to sync them up. So that's, that is, there's more effort involved in that, but it means that I don't have to rely on an ancient four track machine, which could have many, many issues. And I really just didn't want to get into that. So that was, that was my thinking. I thought, well, look, if I have a new tape deck and I put the old tapes in there, then yeah, okay, there will be a bit of hassle with reversing recordings and stuff like that. That would that will be a bit of a pain. Synchronizing will be a bit of a pain, but it's not a big deal. And it's going to save me the hassle of having to work with older, more unreliable equipment. This is what I was thinking. And anyway, to be honest with you, if I've got a six track recording, I'm gonna to have to do some of that anyway. So I didn't think it would make that much difference. So what, what I've got in front of me here is just the recordings from one of the four track tapes. And this has got a particular track on which I'm gonna uh, look at the process and look at some of the issues on it. So. As I said, I didn't record all four tracks together, but all four tracks are here. And I think the only thing that's happened is that A is recorded straight, B was recorded reverse, and has now been flipped. So it is the right way around. Now I think you can hear a couple of issues. Obviously it's not lined up, that's, that's number one. But also there's something a bit off in the tuning. The strings sound off. And bearing in mind that these four tracks were all recorded together. Theoretically, that shouldn't be a problem. So that was a bit of a surprise to me, as you can imagine. Um, and of course, what, what I realized is there was other stuff going on, you know, because, you know, you've got issues with the tension in the tape. Um, the fact that it, the, the tape is being played the, in the opposite direction, which means the ratios between the, uh, the tape spools are different. And that could affect, just subtly affect the tuning. And, the, you know, the, that sort of issue is obviously not going to be there if you recorded all four tracks at the same time from the original uh, four track uh, machine. So, but I didn't really think that through properly. But So let's see if I can get that lined up better. I'm just from the visual cue, I'm going to assume that this light is supposed to line up with this. You've got to bear in mind that all these bar markings are completely irrelevant. There's no grid here at all. Okay, let's see what that sounds like. Yeah, the whole thing is slipping out. <laughs> I think that's enough. The problem is I've got to adjust that then. So the what effectively one of them is too fast or one of them is too slow, depending on your point of view. Now, if I have a look at the effects, um, go to time to pitch, time pitch, stretch, um, and it gives you options. So time stretch, pitch shift, in cakewalk, 
it preserves the pitch or it preserves the tempo. I don't want it to preserve anything. I just want it to resample it. Um, and then what I can do is I can change the ratio. So yeah, so if I wanted to do twice the speed, I'd actually put 50. What I had to do then was make a reasonable guess. So 100 would be, it's no change whatsoever. If I'm deciding that I need the track to be a little bit faster, a little bit higher pitched, then I would maybe go something like 99. Now you can hear there, it doesn't actually sound that much different because it's 99%. By putting in 99, I'm saying that I want the length to be 99% of what it was before. Therefore, it's slightly shorter. Therefore, it's slightly faster in terms of the tempo. It's literally just speeding it up so that it becomes 99%. Now, when I was actually doing this for real in the tracks, I was doing stuff like 99.7 because the amount of difference was so small that I just needed to adjust it just a tiny amount just to bring it into sync. That was kind of the process I was doing. So I'd be taking tracks out, um, bringing them in here, adjusting the pitch very slightly. Then I would take them back into Cakewalk. Then I'd reline them up, then see if they match better by looking at a beat at the beginning of the track and a beat at the end of the track. And if they lined up in both places, then I knew that they were the right length. So it was quite often a case of looking for regular beats. It's a very visual process, actually. It wasn't so much about hearing things. It was about spotting features within the waveform, which I could then match up. So like, for instance, here, where you can see that they definitely, these start together, but then they gradually go out of sync. Now, if I go towards the end of the track and perhaps zoom in here, if it'll let me, let's see how out of sync it is. Yeah, so probably this here is supposed to match with this. Now you'd need to check that with your ears, but you could do that just by moving things around. Does it sound in sync now? And then you make those adjustments and maybe you make these two tracks shorter or these two tracks longer one or the other, it's kind of six, one, half a dozen the other. On occasions where you were so close that all you really needed to do, there weren't any really tuning issues because you were so close, but there were still some sync issues, then I would actually make a cut and then manually move things, particularly if it was something like um, a solo line where there was a big space anyway. <clears throat> it didn't make any difference. I could just shift them very slightly. And all of that sort of stuff was fairly straightforward. So there's only one other thing that I think is really worth looking at from a purely technical point of view, um, and that is just how to split them out. Now, I guess every door is going to have its um, its own way of doing things, and I'm working in Cakewalk, which is not one of the most common ones. Um, so this is how I did it. Now, I don't know whether this is the easiest way of doing it, but you know, this is what I did anyway. So what I would do is uh, duplicate the track, and I want the events as well. Okay, so now I've got two of them. And I want to have insert the effect, so channel tools. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down the right gain on that one. Insert channel tools again. And this one turned down the left gain. This is channel tools, by the way. There we go, left gain down popping up on the other screen. So there doesn't seem to be any way to just split stereo track into two monos directly. I, I not found it anyway. Um, so I'm probably just doing it in a really bad way, but it shouldn't have any effect on the audio quality. So that's the main thing. So what I've done is I've copied those over like that. Um, and then, so those effects will then be applied directly on these tracks. And then I'm going to bounce to clips, which basically means it's going to apply the effects and then crash maybe. Okay. And on this one, I'll do exactly the same. Okay. 
And then it does have a convert to mono function. So if I go convert to mono, well, what it would do is it sums the left and right track and turns it into mono. That's not what I want because obviously I've got completely different information on the left and right channel. So there you go. It's not exactly simple, but it, it, it does the job. And there's probably a better way to do it. And if you know that, if you know the answer, then let me know. Because then next time I do anything like this, I won't have to waste so much time mucking around like that. Um, but essentially, however you do that and whatever door you're using, you want to separate out the tracks, individual track into individual tracks. Um, that's fairly obvious. And that's how I did it on this one. Hopefully that's of use. And that, that might give you a starting point for how you would go about transferring your four track recordings to digital. If you've enjoyed that, then please um, consider leaving a like, consider subscribing, because I'm going to be doing the second part. Yeah, so and don't forget, you can check out the album. I'll leave a link to that. Um, see what you think. Anyway, um, until then, um, thanks very much for watching and uh, hopefully see you on the next part. Bye.